In this video, we're going to do two examples where for each example we're given a mathematical limit statement and we want to translate that mathematical limit statement into a formal limit uh, statement that involves the delta epsilon n and or m uh, depending on the context of what's given in the mathematical limit statement. In addition to the statement, we're going to sketch a graph that would illustrate the roles of the constants that we're using in the formal statement of the limit. And so for this first example, we have the limit as x goes to negative 3 of the square root of x plus 7 equals 2. And so what I recommend doing first is noting that this, um, this negative 3 here is our c value. The, the square root of x plus 7 is our function. And this 2 value is our limit. And so what we have is a finite c, a number for c. We have a finite l, which is a number. And so this is going to be the standard epsilon delta definition uh, for the formal statement. Um, notice also that we're not looking at one-sided limits, so we're going to be having a punctured interval for the x's. So that formal statement for the epsilon delta statement is for all epsilon greater than 0. There exists a delta greater than 0. And so it says such that if, this is telling us where x is living, so we say x is an element of, and we're talking about a punctured interval around c. Well, c is negative 3. And so what we're talking about then is the c value negative 3 minus the delta up until c, which is the negative 3. And then we have the c value negative 3 up until um, the, the c value negative 3 plus delta. We'll extend that a bit. And so that's the punctured interval around the particular c value that we were given of negative 3. Okay. So with that punctured interval, we would be able to trace back into having our function be in an interval around L. And so our function here is the square root of x plus 7. And that's going to land in the interval around L. Well, L is 2, so it would be 2 plus, or sorry, 2 minus epsilon to minus epsilon to 2 plus epsilon. Remember, intervals go from small values to large values. Okay. So that would be our formal statement given the mathematical statement that we have, and we need to be able to graph this to be able to uh, show what these constants that are needed, the delta and the epsilon, uh, how they come into play. So we know the square root function um, would be kind of the, the upper part of kind of a parabola opening to the right, and that needs to be shifted left 7 based on the plus 7 that's on the inside there of the square root. And so our, our function is looking like this. That would be our function square root of x plus 7. So um, we have, I guess we'll go ahead and note that that's at negative 7. So the negative 3 value, which is our C value that we're talking about, is somewhere over here. So we've got the negative 3. Okay. Uh, that negative 3 is going to correspond on the graph to the limit value of 2. And so what we need to do then here is it says for all epsilon greater than 0, so we're talking about deviating from that 2 up and down by epsilon. So we'd have a 2 plus epsilon, and we'd have a 2 minus epsilon. And if we were to take those y values and hit the function and trace back down, we've got a couple of x values that would go with it. We've got two x values there. So notice that we've got a small distance here to the left and a larger distance there to the right from that c value of negative 3 going to the x values that we were able to trace back and get. And so what we really have here is the delta interval that would fit in between has to utilize the smaller distance. And so here would be our negative 3 um, minus the delta would be the left end point that we got. And then to be symmetric across the interval, that other end point of the interval there would be the negative 3 plus the delta. And that right-hand side does not go all the way out to the x value we trace down to um, because we needed to uh, choose the smaller distance to keep our um, vertical strip inside the one that we get for tracing back. So that's how we would do that particular example, and we can do another one here that would be very similar. 
the one there's two different things that are going on here in this example in comparison to the first we do still have the c value as a number but uh, notice it's on the right side here so we're going to have to focus in on not a punctured interval but just the right interval uh, we still have the function listed here it's just a, a shift of a parent function that should be fairly familiar. And then the difference here is our L is um, infinite. Uh, so we're not looking at a finite number there. And so um, what we have here is instead of starting out with the for all epsilon greater than zero, since L is not finite but rather infinite, we switch it over to the M notation, for all M greater than zero. There exist, well, the C is finite, so we stick there with a small deviation, the small distance there on the x-axis. So it would be, um, there exists delta greater than zero, such that if, well, we've got to stay focused on what C is. C is negative two, and we're looking only to the right of it. So our x would be in the interval to the right of negative two. So it'd be negative two to negative two plus the delta. So you have just the C plus interval side, not the C minus interval side there. And when we have that set up, that tells us that our function, which we know to be one over X plus two, is going to be in the interval that we have, we can think about it as the interval at infinity. And so we would have the large Y value M to infinity being our interval. So now to be able to um, graph this to show our delta and our M appropriately, we need to first graph the function. Well, uh, the function 1 over x plus 2 is a shift to the left um, by 2 of the parent function 1 over x, which would have the vertical asymptote there at uh, negative 2 um, due to the shift. So we have our vertical asymptote here at negative 2. And uh, the shape of the graph looks like this. We have um, that graph has a horizontal asymptote at uh, on the x-axis. Okay. So we know that we have a shift there, negative 2, and of course then that x value negative 2 is the interesting one because it's our vertical asymptote which is pushing the function up to infinity. And so we have a for all m greater than 0 and we understand m to be kind of a large uh, y value there, a large positive y value. So when we trace over here to the function we see that the function um, is touched just that one place, we can bounce down to the x value to get that one x value that goes along with it. And what that ends up being then is our, our negative c, the c, or sorry, the negative 2, which is our c value, plus the delta value that would go along with the m value that we start. And so uh, that gives us a picture of the right-hand limit because we were only looking at what's happening on the right-hand side of this function. We weren't looking at the left-hand side. At the left-hand side, it goes to negative infinity. But at the right-hand side, it does go to positive infinity. So we're only looking at that interval to the right of our C value negative 2. And we were able to trace back to figure out what the delta could be based on the distance there between those that C value and the X value we trace back to.